beautiful job of the choir. And uh, offertory was beautiful too, by the way. Kids, what, what, what great looking kids you have here uh, this morning on Easter Sunday, 2023. Jerry, where are you? You did a great job too, my friend, on that illustration. I might say it was excellent, I'm just saying. I'm not yoking you either. Just, just uh, it was very good. Thanks for, for sharing with the kids that away this morning. If you have your Bible, I certainly invite you before uh, we get there, uh, Luke's Gospel, chapter 24. But uh, the early believers had a unique way of greeting each other on Easter Sunday morning. And what would happen would be something like this. A person would turn to a friend and say, Christ has risen. And that friend would respond and say, Christ has risen indeed. So we're going to try that this morning. Let's stand together for just a second here. Uh, uh, and, and I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, Christ has risen. And have your neighbor in turn respond to you and say, Christ has risen indeed. Let's try it. You may be seated. Now, if you want to startle your waiter today, if you happen to eat out, you say Christ has risen, he's not going to know how to respond more than likely. But as you greet family and friends today, and as we think about uh, future Easter's, perhaps that's a good way. Sometimes it seems like uh, Happy Easter, it's a good greeting, but I, I think certainly this gets closer to the heart of what Easter is truly all about. Luke's Gospel, chapter 24. It's called Good Friday, but for two believers from a small village just northwest of Jerusalem, uh, nothing at this point, it's the first day of the week, felt good to them. Everything good seemed to die on that very day, that Friday. It's Sunday, but uh, Cleopas and his friend, um, it, it just seemed it would be Friday for the rest of their lives. The masses in Jerusalem at Sunday morning at this point as we find ourselves in Gospel chapter 24. Some unique things have happened. But masses of people in Jerusalem, pretty much back to normal in terms of, of what life would have been for the majority of the people there. Uh, life returning back to normal after all had transpired from Friday and, of course, uh, Sabbath on Saturday. So these guys are, are uh, heading home, a bit confused, a bit... Uh, discouraged to say the least. As we listen in on their conversation, we, we gather uh, some unique things in terms of observations that we can make along the way. Um, listening to them, it appears as if, you know, things will never ever return to normal. No Passover would ever be the same because they have witnessed um, Jesus as the Lamb of God being led to the slaughter. No sacrifice ever made from this point forward would be the same because what they had envisioned in their mind was the mutilated, bloodied body of the Lord Jesus outstretched upon a God-forsaken cross. That's how they would remember every sacrifice made. Since these men were from Emmaus, uh, they were friends with the Lord Jesus, or so it would seem as we read the context here in Luke's Gospel in chapter 24. No doubt a lot of strangers probably probed them just a bit to see, you know, where they were in their thinking, having seen and witnessed all that had transpired since Friday. A lot of questions. They wanted to know what had happened and... Um, probably even ask certain questions in regards to what their plans would be from this point onward. Since the city was swollen with an overflow of traffic uh, and travelers, uh, these guys just sort of wanted to get away from it all. They wanted to think and talk and sort of somehow or another sort out all that had transpired. Lots to sort out for them. You see, they had staked their future. They had staked their hopes for Israel. They had staked their hopes for a deliverance, a political national deliverance upon this man called Jesus. And yet, all that seemed to dissipate on Friday. At least it seemed so. They staked their future and eternal life on his words. And now, his words were silenced. He's gone. Their hopes were shattered. 
How could they rebuild from the rubble of what had transpired over the last two to three days? And so they, they, they had options. They could have gone north, and they could have gone in that direction uh, to Ephraim, but that was a little too far. They could have gone uh, to the east over toward uh, Jericho, some 17 miles away, but that was a very dangerous stretch of road. They could have gone south where they could have encountered Bethlehem, but of course... Um, they wanted to forget everything about that person. So they head west, northwest, in hopes of getting out of town, in hopes of getting away from it all, in hopes of somehow or another uh, bringing things into perspective. Nothing but memories lingered in terms of their time in Jerusalem, but uh, those of a, of a might-have-been-savior Messiah, and now he was dead. So at least they thought he was dead. So they leave. They believe in a head northwest, unmet dreams, rumors of resurrection, rumors of an empty tomb, rumors of undisturbed grave clothes, but that's all they had to go on, rumors. So we see them going home and picking up the story as we do so, we, we find it sort of moving from part to part. And the first we see in verses 13 and 14 of chapter 24 in Luke's gospel where, where they're going home, they're confused and they're confounded. Let's look at it together, picking it up in verse 13. And behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were conversing with each other about all the things that had taken place. I remember as a young boy, I would visit my grandparents uh, uh, about every weekend, it would seem. We'd help them with a little farm that they had as, uh, as uh, dad would take me up there and we'd help with the chores, etc. And I remember as a little boy seeing this picture that was uh, leading into their dining area, a very small house. And it was the very picture of these two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And at the time, I really didn't ask any questions because I'm not sure why I didn't ask the questions. But that was what that picture portrayed. These men going home confused and confounded. Some seven miles. They had dreamt of Messiah. They had dreamt of, of, of Rome being overthrown. They had dreamt of, of a nation that would be freed from the bondage of Roman domination. They had dreamed of a time when, when men would take their swords and beat them into plowshares. They dreamed of a moment when the wolf and the lion and the lamb would lie down together. They dreamed of a day when there would be peace on earth, but that all seemed to have vanished on Friday. Who would have thought this? I mean, a week earlier, as, as uh, Jesus made his way into Jerusalem, there were all kinds of things taking place, all kinds of accolades, all kinds of recognition of him as Messiah. They were crying out messianic uh, uh, scripture, if you will, from the psalm saying, Blessed is the King of Israel, and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And now all that seems to have dissipated. Again, they're confused, they're confounded. Rumors of resurrection, empty tomb, women supposedly who had encountered an angelic being who said he's not there, he's risen. So they keep trekking along in their perplexity as we see it unfold here before us. Now notice the second part of the story. Uh, Jesus, he's incognito at this point. They are supernaturally hindered from seeing and understanding who he was. So he's just a, a traveler, a fellow traveler at this point. As far as they're concerned, uh, let's pick it up and look here where we see him. That is Jesus drawing close, befriending the brokenhearted. Notice the next two verses, verses 15 and 16. And it came about that as they were conversing, discussing... What were they discussing? All that had transpired in the last three days. Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. Now notice verse 16. Their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. So, two men on a walk, heading home, certainly discouraged, distraught. All their hopes had been pinned upon this one called the Messiah. All those thoughts and hopes had been doused and, and, and deadened, if you will. And so they're making their way home. 
They're brokenhearted undoubtedly, and Jesus joins them, and they're not aware that it's Jesus who is now walking with them. So what we see here is the third part of the story in verses 17 through 24, and we see Jesus as he does so often. For example, in John's Gospel, chapter 4, we see him doing the very same thing in terms of conversation with the woman at the well. He's creating curiosity. He's creating curiosity and cultivating a conversation with him. Let's pick it up in verse 17. And he, Jesus, said to them, what are these words you are exchanging with one another as you're walking? And, and, and they stood still looking sad. I mean, they're kicking the can down the road. They're just so distraught, so upset about all that's transpired. It's written on their faces, for he makes reference to that here in verse 17. And then one of them named Cleopas, verse 18, answered and said, Are you the only a visitor in Jerusalem unaware of the things that have happened here? And he, Jesus, said to them, What things? Pretty interesting conversation, isn't it? And then they went in and explained, well, Jesus of Nazarene, he was the prophet, mighty in word and deed, uh, uh, before the people, uh, how the chief priests came and they, uh, they delivered him up to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. Notice verse 21, we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides this, it's the third day since these things have happened. So, Jesus here uh, engages them in conversation, cultivates conversation, utters a very uh, pointed question, and uh, point-blank response, are you the only one in Jerusalem? You're not sure? You're not aware? Did you not pick up the phone? Do you not understand all that has happened? Are you the only one here in Jerusalem in the last two and a half days and you're unaware of what's happened? And Jesus said, what things are you talking about? And they chronicle for him, that is, uh, the, these two men chronicle for him all that had happened, all the illegal maneuverings on the part of the religious leaders, Caiaphas and Annas, and how they manipulated the situation and how he was tried under the cover of darkness Three civil trials, three religious trials, how he was betrayed and arrested under the cover of darkness, how he was scourged, and how Pilate was a coward, not standing up for what was right. And then, of course, it says in verse 21, they had pinned their hopes upon him to be the Messiah, and now it's the third day. So, they give him an idea of all that had taken place. They bring him up to speed of the last two to three days there in Jerusalem. And so this scene here shifts as we pick it up, for example, in verse 25. And, and here we find him beginning to clarify confusion and explaining enigmas, okay? Clarifying confusion and explaining enigmas. Now Jesus begins to speak, and he says these words, O foolish men, slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary? Was it not of of spiritual uh, and moral necessity for Christ to suffer these things and to enter into glory? And Jesus, at that point, gives them a walkthrough, an Old Testament walkthrough, helping them understand just how Christocentric the Old Testament is. Notice what it says in verse 27. And beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in the scriptures. And as they were approaching the village where they were going, he acted as if he would go further. That is the Lord Jesus. So we see this uh, clarifying confusion and explaining enigmas. So this, this walk, this seven-mile walk, becomes a seven-mile theological roadshow. I mean, they are given the privilege of learning things about the Lord Jesus in the Old Testament that perhaps they never had ever given thought to. So we see uh, the book, the entirety of the Bible, is Christological. It's uh, Christocentric in nature, and certainly the Old Testament is the same. And so he begins to explain to them, starting with the teachings of Moses in the book of Genesis, chapter 3, for example, where it says that the head of the serpent would have a death blow by by the heel of the seed of the woman. Well, that's a reference to Christ and his redemptive work. 
And then today, no doubt, Jesus is explaining and say, you know, uh, the Ark of the Covenant. Well, Jesus is the Ark and the blood upon the mercy seat. That is a foreshadowing and a type of the coming Christ. Search the scriptures of Moses and you will see that Christ is the light on the golden lampstand. Jesus himself said, I'm the light of the world. He is the prophet that preached like Elijah. He is the, uh, he is the priest that prayed like Aaron. He is a king like David. And so Jesus walks him through the entirety of the Old Testament. And he said something, no doubt, about Jonah. Jonah, as he was three days and three nights in the belly of the well, so also must the Son of Man be. So we see here... Jesus giving them this incredible explanation from Moses and the prophets that the majority of the Old Testament is that which, which speaks of the Christ. I can't imagine this was probably the most enlightening five to seven mile walk in human history. And so they reach their destination. They still do not understand. They're still supernaturally hindered from seeing and understanding who Jesus is at this point. So Jesus uh, comes to the location there where uh, these guys are going to make their exit and and exit off to home, and uh, they extend to him an invitation. Hey, rather than going on, why don't you just stay with us for a while? And Jesus accepts the invitation. You see, the Bible's full of invitations. It really is. There's an invitation even this morning. This is resurrection morning. Christ is alive. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. He is alive. He's a well. His resurrection proves to each of us that He is truly the Son of God, that He paid an adequate price for our sins, and He extends to you and I an invitation. He says these words, Behold, I stand at your heart's door knocking. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and fellowship with him and he with me if you're here this morning you sense the spirit of god is moving in your heart in a way perhaps he's not done so for a while or or perhaps ever it could be the spirit of god the spirit of christ extending to you an invitation today to embrace jesus christ for who he is what he has done he is the savior of mankind so What do they do? They invite Jesus in as a guest here. And uh, notice what happens here as we pick it up here. Let me see where we are. Uh, Yeah, verse 28. Let's look at it. And they approached the village. They were going, and he acted as if he would go further. That is Jesus. And they urged him, saying, stay with us. It's getting toward evening, and the day is nearly over. And he went in. And stayed with them. Now notice verse 30. It's very interesting here. You've got to understand what's transpiring here. And how it is these guys finally pick up the, the idea or the truth, the fact of the matter, that this man is the Christ. Notice what it says. And it was about, uh, and it came about that he had reclined at the table with them, and he took bread and blessed it, and breaking it, he gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and he and they recognized him. You see, back then in those days, uh, bread was in a loaf; it was not sliced. And so, as Jesus is sitting down to share a meal with them, Jesus moves from being the guest to the to the host. He he breaks the bread, and in the very act of breaking the bread, they're able to see the the nail prints in his hands. Okay. That's the evidence here as we see it. Their eyes were open, verse 31. They recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. Now notice verse 35 for just a minute. Helps us understand what helped them understand and recognize who he was. And they they made a trip to Jerusalem. We'll talk about that in a second. And they, they, they related to all those guys back in Jerusalem that they recognized him in the breaking of the bread, okay? So, again, it was in that very act, as we see it here, that uh, he's breaking bread, and they recognize it here in the presence of the resurrecting Christ. The story goes on to say, you know, uh, as they begin to dialogue one with another, said, you know, were our hearts not burning within us, as he was explaining to us the Old Testament scriptures, unlike anything we've ever experienced, 
And so what do they do? They immediately go back to Jerusalem, some seven miles, probably in record time. And here we see them in ceaseless celebration, uh, going back to Jerusalem to share with the rest of the disciples what they had experienced. Notice what it says here in verse, well, let's pick it up in 32. It says, they said to one another, uh, were not our hearts burning within us as he was speaking to us on the road? They just never, ever experienced anything like that, ever, as he was explaining to us the scriptures. And they arose that very hour, probably that very minute, and returned to Jerusalem and found gathered together the eleven who were hiding behind locked doors and those that were with him, saying, The Lord really is risen. He has appeared to to Simon. And they began to relate to each other the experiences on the road, how they recognized him by the breaking of the bread. So that flickering flame of faith is now stoked into this unquenchable fire. Now, as we think about this, here we find two post-resurrection appearances of Jesus after his death on the cross. There's probably at least 13, if not 15, post-resurrection appearances of Jesus after his death. One time he appeared to 500 brethren at one time. So we see here uh, uh, him appearing to them, dismantling their doubt. And you're probably wondering, okay, this is 2,000 years later. How does that relate to me? What does the resurrection mean? It means a lot. Can you say a lot? A lot. Listen, when you factor in eternity and the prospect of eternal life, the resurrection means everything. Can I get an amen? I'm just help. It means everything. It means because he lives someday when they place me into that, that box in the ground, I too shall live. I too shall experience resurrection because Jesus said it so beautifully. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he dies, yet shall he live. Amen? Resurrection shows us that Jesus Christ holds the key to eternal life. He secured it for us. The gospel stands or falls on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Had he not paid an adequate payment for our sins, his lifeless body would have remained in the ground. I was in Jerusalem, I don't know, 10 years ago probably now, And I had a chance on Easter Sunday to speak about 200 yards from the empty tomb. There was another large service, and we had a group of about 80 off to the side. But I did indeed get to go into the empty tomb, and it was like that Cheerio box up here. Guess what? It was empty. Like Jerry's billfold, it was empty, right? (laughs) Our salvation stands and falls on the the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our own resurrection itself stands and falls on the reality of Jesus' resurrection. The Bible says these words in Romans chapter 4, verse 25. He was delivered up because of our transgressions, but he was raised because of our justification. In other words, the payment was complete. It was full. He was raised up from the dead. He was raised to life. He was raised up and went through the walls and the stone at the tomb, past the guards, validating his identity. And now he is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven, awaiting the time to return for you and me. You've got some notes there. Let me just help you fill in the gap there on that. To live without faith in the resurrection. To live without faith in the resurrection is to deny historical evidence. Some 13 to 15 post-resurrection appearances of the Lord Jesus Christ. To die without hope in the resurrection is to face a barren eternity. True story It's some years ago. There was a Norwegian fisherman who had a rather primitive-like fishing business 
off the coast of one of the, I think it was the North Sea. And uh, he and his two boys were out fishing one afternoon. And as they went out to fish, a gigantic storm rolled in, unlike anything they'd ever experienced. Black clouds rolled in, uh, covering the skies. The skies were as dark as, as the pitch of black at night. There was a lighthouse not far from their house. They'd usually go out maybe three, four miles from, from the shoreline of their home. They had a small little seaside cottage, and up on the cliffs was, uh, was uh, a lighthouse. Well, the winds were so uh, contrary, and the, and the rain was so strong, it washed out the light in the lighthouse. And so they're out there on the sea groping in darkness, having no idea whether to row this direction or this direction or this direction. They're at a loss, not knowing exactly what to do. In the meantime, as they're groping out on the sea, the angry sea, their cottage, Ingrid, the wife, the mother of the boys, was in the cottage, and as the winds were blowing, it blew open a window, knocked over a lantern, and caught their home on fire. She did the best she could to try to somehow or another put out the fire, but it was not successful. The entire structure went up in flames. Finally, uh, Carl and the boys made their way back to shore. And Ingrid was really upset. She felt like she had failed the family. She said, Carl, everything we own, our house, our belongings, they're all gone. And Carl acted as if he hardly heard what she said. He was strangely unmoved. She said, Carl, did you hear what I said? Everything we've owned is gone. He said, yes, Ingrid, I heard you. But a few hours ago, we were lost at sea, fighting the wind and waves, wondering whether or not we were going to live. Our only guide to the shoreline was the lighthouse on the cliff. However, that light had been extinguished by the, the rains and the winds. I was certain that the boys and I, Ingrid, we were going to die. And then, Ingrid, I noticed a little dim yellow glow off in the distance. We quickly turned the boat and began, as hard as we could, rowing toward the light. The more we rode, the brighter the, the light became. At the peak of the blaze, I could see the entire shoreline where our house once stood. You see, Ingrid, the same fire that destroyed our house created a light that literally saved our lives. Listen, you and I are in the seas of life. And the lights are out. Our sense of direction is confused. Our ship, perhaps, is going down. And the only way to get to the shoreline of eternal safety is the light of the resurrection. Through the tragedy of a burning house, a family was saved. And through the tragedy of a crucified Jesus, we have a risen Savior. And because He lives, we can live also. The lowly carpenter of Nazareth is the mighty architect of eternal life. And this is all confirmed by the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ because he lives we shall live also would you bow with me as we pray together well friend if you're here this morning and you're not sure you're a child of God this should be your day this should be your Easter that you would remember for the rest of your life you see in Christ our past is settled in Christ, our present is covered. In Christ, our future is secure. You see, the lonely, lowly carpenter of Nazareth is the mighty architect of eternal life. And this is confirmed by the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Friend, 
The importance of the resurrection cannot be underestimated. You see, it's, it's part of the pillar of the gospel. Listen carefully as I read Paul's words in Romans chapter 10. You see, it's essential that we embrace the resurrection. He says these words, If you will confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, here it is, God hath raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. You shall be saved. For with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you're here this morning and you're not really sure, uh, what a blessed time to make sure this day of resurrection, this Easter 2023, right there where you're seated. Let me just challenge you if you're not sure that you're saved. Make this your day. Uh, The Lord wants to give you resurrection life and the prospect of a future resurrection. If you just there where you're seated with your head bowed, just make this your heart's prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, dear Lord Jesus, I believe you to be the Son of God. I believe you to be the infinite God-man that, that paid the penalty for my sins. Uh, you purchased for us, uh, for me, a place in heaven. We thank you, Lord, for that. And yes, Lord, you arose from the dead. I believe that today. Friend, the Bible says, Jesus speaking, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Would you respond? Would you trust him? Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I cannot save myself. I believe you to be the Son of God. Yes, I believe that you arose from the dead. And right now, as best I know how, Lord Jesus, I'm placing my full and complete faith and trust in you. Come into my life, forgive me my sins, make me a part, Lord, of of your forever family. Friend, if you could make that your heart's prayer, it doesn't have to be the exact words, but if that's your heart's direction today, you can experience life eternal. You see, Jesus is the architect. He paid the full price for our sins In fact, when he uttered it is finished, the resurrection is the exclamation point to the fact that he did pay the price for us. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And friend, that's what we have in the blessed resurrection of our Lord Jesus. Lord, we thank you for the time together with your dear people here. We pray, O God, that you would work in our hearts. Lord, if there's one or two or three that's not sure of their salvation, may this be their day. This be the day where they can just nail that down and have it forever settled. And Lord, uh, we just would just ask that you would work in that way. Now, friend, as uh, we close here, if I can be of help to you in that way, I want to remain to the front here at the end of the service. And I'd love to just open the scriptures and help you uh, make that uh, journey complete today in terms of placing faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, bless these, your people. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.